sisters the holy spirit is a wonderful person is very gentle only if we allow him to work in us to do the work of transformation in us will he do for he is very gentle he is the source of gentleness jesus said learn from me for i am gentle the spirit of jesus is gentle we ought to be gentle like jesus only with the help of the holy spirit can we be gentle holy spirit he transforms us he frees us from all our rebellious nature and he transforms us into gentle person like jesus for we are all called to be like jesus as the scripture says the holy spirit transforms us from from glory to glory into his image as we are worshiping the holy spirit does the work of transformation dear brother sister the holy spirit works when we worship him he will show up when we worship him let us worship him let us worship him together as we sing the song this is the realm of your glory this is the realm of your glory i can feel your mighty power in us moving in this place Yeah. 
Dear brother sister our god is a holy god he has said in his word be holy for i am holy we are all called to be holy it is the holy spirit who makes us holy for he is the holy spirit it is the presence of the holy spirit that makes us holy it's god who makes us holy and the scripture says it is the holy spirit who does the work of sanctification in 2 thessalonians Chapter 2 was 13 the word of god says but we ought to always give thanks to god for you brothers beloved by the lord because god chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth minute by minute second by second the holy spirit who is in in us he is doing the work of sanctification he is making us holy to be pleasing to god let us desire to be holy let us be determined that we want to be holy and the work is done by the holy spirit let us ask the holy spirit let us pray to him Spirit come 
Holy Spirit, you are the spring of love filling my heart with God's love all the time. That's your promise. Whenever I meet with sad experiences of rejection, discouragement, Holy Spirit, refresh me with your love. They may never get depressed. They may never slip into self-pity and anger. But I may be able to respond to such situations with love and joy. That I may become a channel of your love to everyone around me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear sisters and brothers, whenever we speak of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, we speak in the plural fruits of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, St. Paul in Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23, St. Paul speaks of nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. But then he introduces these nine fruits not as fruits but fruit. And he begins by saying the fruit, and that is love. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, all the fruits are the different dimensions or characteristics of the one fruit of love. Love the power of love. That's what the Holy Spirit gives us, fills us with when the Holy Spirit enters into our hearts. God's love filling us. Now, let us look into our own hearts, our own past. All of us want to be loved. There is a thirst in our hearts to be loved. And that thirst has always been there, even from the moment of our birth. When we look back, we always wanted to be loved, to be accepted, to be appreciated, to be admired. 
and we would realize when we make an honest analysis when we came home from a school when we came home with good marks well the faces of our parents brightened up but when we came home not with good marks there's no such smile on the faces of our parents when we came home with trophies they hugged us appreciated us and when we came home with no trophies they did not welcome us with such warmth and later in life when we became victorious others applauded us and they admired us and we came to a conclusion in order to be loved in order to be appreciated in order to be someone in life we must have trophies trophies in our cupboard and our brain our brain advised us you must you must acquire as many trophies as possible and that's what we were about we became we became grabbers grabbing persons we wanted to acquire beauty education wealth authority power position mansion well everything to be appreciated to be applauded to be loved but often the more we grabbed we realized the less we were satisfied the more we grabbed the less we were happy the more thirsty we became we became more angry we slipped into self pity after all others were better than i we remained more dissatisfied and that became a sort of sadness and sorrow in our hearts more and more complaints more and more irritated and more and more angry and that's what the track of our life was perhaps now this orientation of our life is a very sad track that we followed and what is jesus offering us the great offer of jesus is to change this orientation of our heart to transform this thirst of the flesh and turn to the spirit and that's what jesus said to the samaritan woman john chapter 4 talking to the samaritan woman john chapter 4 verses 13 and 14 jesus said if you drink of this water you will become thirsty again jesus was trying to make her get in touch with her thirst thirst for love this was a woman 
who was trying to grab love from men after men a thirst that was never quenched that water jar was the symbol of that thirst that was never filled and jesus said to her jesus answered and said to her everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again but whoever drinks the water that i shall give will never thirst the water that i shall give will become in him spring of water welling up to eternal life the living water that will well up from within us to eternal life and you will never be thirsty again and st john interprets that jesus was speaking of the holy spirit the spring of living water welling up within us welling up within us for eternal life and later in john chapter 7 in the temple now john chapter 4 it was a promise given to one woman a very sinful woman but then in john chapter 7 it was to a crowd in the temple of jerusalem the pious religious crowd gathered for the festival on the last and greatest day john chapter 7 verse 37 greatest day of the feast jesus stood up and exclaimed that anyone who is thirsty again the thirst who is thirsty come to me and drink whoever believes in me as the scripture says rivers of living water will flow from within him he said this in reference to the spirit that those who came to believe in him were to receive living water living water of the holy spirit flowing from within him welling up welling up within him flowing out of him but jesus promises is a change a total transformation of the human heart so far we were speaking about a heart that grabs thirsting for love now jesus is speaking of a heart that gives love that's able to serve love give love to everyone because there is the fullness of love filling the human heart that fullness because there is the holy spirit the holy spirit is the fullness of love remember st john said god is love love is the nature of god and the nature of god the fullness of love coming and dwelling in the human heart and that love filling the human heart welling up the spring of love filling the human heart flowing out of the heart to everyone the very nature of the human person will be changed a human person becoming a person so filled enabling the human person to share love giving love to everyone what exactly happened in the early christian community when the early christian community was anointed with the holy spirit the people became so happy so loving so caring no one thought anyone should keep anything for himself for herself they sold everything and gave it all to the community giving it to the feet of simon peter and therefore no one in need and 
there was a sharing, a giving. It is so interesting. No one thought they had to keep anything for the future. Their security was the community. Everyone learned to give, to share. And that was the Holy Spirit, the power of love, the power that taught them to give. In giving, they found the joy of life. Of course, even there, there was Ananias and Sapphira. In the beginning, they thought they would give. But then, they became stingy. The generosity failed them. They held something back that became a very sad experience. They fell down dead. You know, my dear sisters and brothers, that experience of the early Christian community, an experience of total giving, a new orientation, the joy of giving, becoming the nature of Christianity. And that's what we need to recapture today. This is what our nature is when the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit cutting at the root of selfishness and self-seeking and, you know, often, often people speak about an oppressive asceticism that has come into Christian spirituality. You know what I mean by oppressive asceticism? You know, some teachers speak about it. You know, when you become angry with someone, um, suppress it. When you feel like uh, doing that, suppress it. You know, that's it, not, it's not Christianity. It's not Christian spirituality. Christian spirituality is not what I do. No, no. Christian spirituality is what the Holy Spirit does in me. Christian spirituality is not muscle power. Christian spirituality is freedom and joyous giving, surrendering myself to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit filling me and guiding me, I giving myself to God and God guiding me in all freedom. I experience the joy of giving and that's what Christian spirituality is, what the Holy Spirit does in my life. You know, when Simon Peter and the other apostles, when they were anointed by the Holy Spirit, they became so free, so happy, so generous, so bold. The people of Jerusalem thought they were intoxicated. These Galileans, they came to Jerusalem, the city, and they went into the bar and they're intoxicated. And Simon Peter knew their thought and they said, oh no, we are not intoxicated with Alcohol is too early to drink. This is the promise given by Prophet Joel of the Holy Spirit. We are intoxicated with the Holy Spirit. Not with alcohol, but with the Holy Spirit. You know, my dear friends, when a person is intoxicated, you will recognize Three ways. In walking, in talking, and smelling. An intoxicated person, you would know him in walking, in talking, and smelling. Same way. A person intoxicated with the Holy Spirit, there will be a difference in walking, in talking, in smelling. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. A 
person intoxicated with the Holy Spirit will be walking to give, to serve love, not to grab love, to serve, give love, give appreciation, to give admiration, to give encouragement, to give a smile, a good word to everyone. Not to grab love from others. It's a beautiful story. First book of Kings, chapter 17, uh, Prophet Elijah. There was a drought in the land. Elijah was told to go and sit in a cave. And God promised the crow would give him bread and meat. And Elijah obeyed God. Every day, morning, noon, evening, the crow would come and give him bread and meat. And Elijah was having a good time every day, morning, breakfast, lunch, and evening meal. Looking at the crow coming with bread and meat, Elijah was not looking at God anymore. Elijah was looking at the crow. And God thought, ah, no, it cannot go like this. Then God said, Elijah, you get up. You get up and go to the town. And there, a widow will feed you. I have instructed a widow to feed you. Elijah got up. Did not know where to go. Did not know the name of the widow. And Elijah just got up and went. And looking around, where is the widow? A widow of Sarapath. Went to the uh, city wall, city gate, and there saw a widow. Uh, perhaps this might be the widow. And this widow carrying some wood. The prophet went and told her, I am prophet Elijah. God has sent me. Now give me some bread. First give me some water. The widow gave him water. Now give me some bread. And the widow, poor widow said, hey, I have a little flour in this jar, a little oil in this jug, just enough for one little bread. And I thought I would make one little bread and eat myself and my little son and we will be waiting to die. That's all we have. You know what the prophet said? First, you make a bread for me. And then whatever is left, you make for you and for your son. When I read this, I lost all my appreciation for this prophet. Well, the widow agreed. Widow agreed to make a bread for Elijah and gave it to him. The widow never thought of herself and her son. This is a prophet of God. God is sending him. And she obeyed God. Whatever little she had, she gave. And as a result, as a result, the jar of flour did not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry. Prosperity, prosperity in a land of drought, prosperity, because she obeyed God. You know, my dear sisters and brothers, often, often we complain, I have only a little. I cannot give. I'm tired of giving. We often complain, I can't serve anymore. I can't give anymore. I'm tired of giving. If I give, I will not have anything for myself. We are complaining generation. In a marriage, in the beginning we are very generous. But as years go by, I can't get up every day. I can't get up every day in the morning at 5 o'clock and prepare breakfast for you. For the last 10 years, I was doing it. I can't do it anymore. If you want to go at 6 o'clock, you better get up early 
and prepare breakfast for you. I'm tired of doing this. I can't forgive you anymore. How many times I have been forgiving? Why can't you correct yourself? I can't forgive like this. Remember, Peter said, uh, how many times? Seven times? Seven times? Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. My jug, my jug is going dry. And God said, never, your jug will never be, uh, never go dry. Your jar will never go empty if I give. There are people who are tired of giving, tired of serving love. This is where, this is where we need to wait for the Holy Spirit to fill our jugs and our jars. There will be prosperity of love. There was an elderly man in a village. His wife, his wife had to go to care for her ailing brother. And husband was alone. The next day morning, he got up and looked into the well. And he saw that the well had water, perhaps 20 um, buckets of water in the well. He calculated, intelligent that he was, he calculated 20 buckets of water. I need 10 buckets of water a day. And if I draw water, this water would be enough for two days. That's all, two days. And if there is any emergency, what will I do? A very practical farmer that he was, he thought he would keep that water for any eventuality, any emergency. So he thought he would take the pot and go to a, a little faraway place and draw water for himself. And he did that for two weeks. Very tiring. But he was a practical man. He kept that water in the well for any emergency. Two weeks after, the wife came. And the wife was drawing water from that well every day. And he said, how can you do that? Any emergency, we need water. And the wife said, every time you draw two buckets of water, two more buckets will spring up. There's a spring underneath. If you draw ten buckets of water, ten more buckets will well up. There's a living spring under the well. You know, my dear sisters and brothers, when we give love, when we serve love, more love will spring up. Living water, Holy Spirit, filling us with love in order that we may be able to serve love. Serving love is our business. As the disciples of Jesus, love will never dry up because there is Holy Spirit in our hearts. So, the first difference Holy Spirit makes when we are intoxicated is walking. The next one, talking. When we are intoxicated with the Holy Spirit, a style of talking will be different. How do we usually talk? When we come home in the evening, oh, I'm tired. I don't know how long I can go like this. I'm the only one to earn in this house. My wife is sitting at home eating and drinking and sleeping. Oh, I'm tired of cooking all the day. And how long can I cook like this? And the children, they're not studying. All. Uh, I don't know how. Words of discouragement. Words of depreciation. Words of tiredness. This style of talking must change. Finding fault with others. The word of appreciation, forgetting myself and thinking of the other to build the other up. As St. Paul said, have a word of appreciation 
a word of praising God. I forget my own tiredness. I care for the other. The style of talking will become different when I am anointed with the Holy Spirit because there's love filling up in my heart. The third difference the Holy Spirit brings a smell. <laughs> An intoxicated person will smell. Intoxicated with the Holy Spirit, there will be the aroma of Christ. What St. Paul tells us, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. For we are the aroma of Christ for God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to the latter, an aroma of death that leads to death to the former, an aroma of life that leads to life, aroma of Christ. My dear sisters and brothers, haven't you felt being with someone, you feel joy, a sort of peace spreading, spreading contagious. Haven't you felt someone you feel is a man of God, she's a woman of God. You feel like being with that person. You feel whatever sadness you went with, the presence the very presence makes you enriched. The aroma of Christ. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit spreading and making you feel so welcome, so joyous. That smell of Jesus Christ, of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does. A presence that makes us feel the presence of God. You know, in the book of Acts, we read when Peter and John were going into the temple, that beggar sitting there asking for something, they had nothing to give. And Peter said, we have no gold or silver. What we have, we give you. Get up and walk. You know, this beggar, he got up and walked rejoicing. Rejoicing. He became a free person. This man was there for a long time, for years. People gave him gold and silver in the past. But he remained a beggar. Peter gave him Jesus, the Holy Spirit. He became a free person, a joyous person. No more a beggar. That's what we must be able to give. Jesus. Jesus. Serving love. What Francis of Assisi said. Become a channel. Of peace. Always seeking. To love. Not grabbing love. Seeking. To give. Not grabbing from others. Holy Spirit, we want to be different. We want to be the aroma of Christ. The presence of Jesus to everyone. Whoever sees us, whoever we talk to, Holy Spirit, let us be able to give love, understanding. Give us the grace never to be grabbers, but to be givers of love that we may become channels of love and peace and joy to everyone around us. Amen.
remember some years ago many people died of TB tuberculosis right but now tuberculosis is not so serious because we know that the background the root cause how to tackle what kind of medicine is useful all the details we know since we know somebody if you know someone that means you conquer that person if you know the virus and every detail of the virus, that means you conquered that virus. There are so many other sicknesses, there is no medicine because we have not yet known completely those viruses. The same way, if you know the designs of the devil, then you can easily conquer him. So that is why knowing the name is very important. Once you know the name, you, the wicked spirit, you, the unclean spirit, you, the spirit of unforgiveness, when you know what kind of spirit, then the spirit will leave immediately because that means you know him. The Once you know him, you have an upper hand on him. That is why the same tactic 
once devil tried on Jesus. How? Devil said, I know you. You are the son of the most high God. See? The devil is trying to reveal that I know you. Therefore, surrender. But Jesus said, get out. And he got out. So, my dear brothers and sisters, knowing the enemy is very important. Knowing the enemy. Suppose, suppose all the doors are all, uh, closed in this hall. All the doors are closed. And uh, there is a tiger outside. A tiger came out of a zoo, is wandering outside of this hall. All of you will be scared. Am I right? Will you be scared? Or will you go and take selfie with him? No. So you will be scared. And uh, you don't know exactly where the, the tiger is hiding. Therefore, you will be somewhere hiding on the altar, on the stage. Because if you stand there, there is a door, there is a door, there is a window, there is a door. So you, you will be frightened to go and stand next to the doors and windows. Suppose if there is a CCTV kept outside all over the all around the auditorium and you can see everything through the CCTV and you came to know the tiger is here in front of this door then you won't be scared to open this door and go out you won't be scared to go and stand there behind because you know where exactly the tiger is so knowing the enemy and when he comes where he comes where he stands how he comes and how he uh, tempts you all those details are very helpful for you it helps you it helps you to conquer the enemy and control the enemy and you will never never be scared you won't be scared but you will be able to face your life without much ten tension anxiety you can just open this door and go out if tiger is here you will open this door and go out no tension no anxiety no worry so we should be aware of the designs of the devil. We read like this. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11. And we do this so that we may not be outwitted by the Satan. For we are not ignorant of his designs. St. Paul wrote to Corinthians saying... We are not ignorant of his designs. What does it mean? The Corinthians, the people in Corinth, and also St. Paul and the apostles, they were not ignorant of the designs of the devil. They were well informed and well aware of the designs of the devil. That's why they were able to control, deal, cast out, exercise evil so easily. Because... They were well informed about the designs of the devil. They knew. Do you know? Do you know the designs of the devil? Are you well aware of it? Then that's why we are scared. That's why we are frightened. That's why many people are worried. Oh, father, there is evil spirit in my home. One is in the parlor, the other one is in the bedroom. The people come and complain like this. Because, and they are so scared. Because they, they don't know the designs. They don't know how the devil works. First of all, we should know who this devil is. And when he comes and how he attacks. Praise the Lord. The first of all, the first impression that we should have is, the devil is not so strong. Devil is the most frightened being in this world. Only those who are frightened will attack. Suppose a small dog and big dog come face to face. Which dog will bark first? Small one. And the big dog will try to avoid the small dog. But the small dog will not leave. It will come after the big one. Go on barking, barking. And the big dog will try to close the ears and go out because sound pollution. But still the small one will not leave the big one. It will go on barking. And in case if the big one turns back and make a big barking. And then the small, small one will go for run for life. 
Then why was he barking? Because he's frightened. Only those who are scared will attack or you will bark. That's why somebody said, barking dog, because they are frightened. Barking dogs seldom bite because they are frightened. Praise the Lord. The devil always attacks. Always try to frighten us. Always bark. Disturbs because he is always frightened. And some people used to ask, Father, if devil is the cause for all the problems, why can't God destroy the devil? Attacks the devil. Why, why didn't God attack the devil, destroy the devil, hit him, kick him, kill him? Then there is another problem. Suppose if when God saw uh, the devil, Satan, suddenly God is so angry, shouted at him, attacked him, wounded him, killed him. What does it mean? It means God is frightened. It means... God is frightened. I told you, only those who are frightened will attack. If he is not an enemy, why should God attack? If God is not scared of him, then why should God come and destroy him? Because God only created all these angels, even the fallen angels. God never destroys anything that he creates. He doesn't want to destroy. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. My dear brothers and sisters, therefore, we should be well aware of the designs of the devil. Praise the Lord. And for example, for, to start with, let's take the gospel passage, gospel passage of uh, gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verse 13 onwards. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now. For it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Now, this is a Bible passage which you must have reflected many times. In this Bible passage, you can imagine, you can picturize this passage in your mind. John the Baptist is baptizing people and there is a big queue standing in front of him waiting to be baptized. And Jesus also joined with this queue and standing with the people. And there's so many people in front of him and behind him. Nobody noticed Jesus because Jesus has not yet revealed himself to the public. And uh, only John the Baptist was the center figure. Everyone was watching John the Baptist. Everyone was respecting John the Baptist. And everyone was glorifying John the Baptist. And he's the hero here. And then Jesus, being unnoticed by anyone, standing in the queue, waiting to be baptized. When the turn comes, Jesus is standing in front of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist recognized him. And John the Baptist said... How come you are here? I should be baptized by you. Then why did you come to me? Then Jesus said, let it be so. Let it happen. Let this happen now. Then John the Baptist baptized Jesus. Suddenly the heaven was opened. Holy Spirit came upon Jesus. And the heavenly father announced publicly, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Everybody saw this. Everyone witnessed something happening there. Everyone heard the sound. Everyone was surprised, shocked. And they all saw John the Baptist standing like this in front of Jesus. Then they knew this man is somebody great. And now everyone's attention is on Jesus. Everyone is glorifying Jesus. Everyone is exalting Jesus. 
and John the Baptist is sidelined. Jesus is the hero now. And the next word, we read the temptation. Next is temptation. The devil comes and attacks him with temptations one after the another. Now remember, when he was not in the limelight, no devil cared. No devil came to him. Now, when Jesus became hero, he became the limelight of everyone. He is the center figure of the whole community. Everyone is focusing on Jesus. Everyone is looking at him. Everyone is glorifying him, exalting him. And the next moment, there is a temptation. My dear brothers and sisters, if you, the day when you are exalted, the day you are glorified, the day something great happens in your life, be very careful. The next moment there is a temptation waiting for you. Am I correct? Praise the Lord. Any, any blessing, maybe suppose you got a very good job and you're so happy. Be happy, but be careful. Because the next moment there is a fall waiting for you if you're not careful. You know, this is very important because in the beginning when God created in Genesis, when God created human beings, immediately after creating human beings, the first six days creations, at the end he created human beings, Adam and Eve. After that, the first thing that happens in the Bible is temptation. Devil comes into picture. After creation, the first thing that human being has to face is temptation from the devil. Now, if you come to New Testament, after the narration of the, you know, the, uh, the nativity story, all the incidents and all those things happen, before the public ministry starts, the first thing Bible speaks is about temptation. That shows, that shows how important it is for us to know the designs and the details of the devil. We don't need to speak too much about him. We don't need to exalt him by giving him all frightening attributes to him because he's nothing. Jesus said, you will, you will stamp on the snakes and scorpions, but nothing will hurt you. His place is always under your foot. He is not supposed to be sitting on your head, but he is supposed to be under your foot. Always be aware of it. So, when is he going to come and attack you? The first place, the first, first, you know, the first design of the devil. When you are in the glory, when you are in the peak of the glory, next moment, there is an attack. For example, when Jesus praised Peter, Jesus asked, who am I? Then G Peter was so happy to give the correct answer and he said, you are the son of the most high living God. Then Jesus said, Simon, you are wonderful. And Jesus praised him. It is not flesh and blood that revealed to you my heavenly father. And then Peter was so happy. And the next moment when Jesus was speaking about suffering, Peter said, this should not happen. Then she said, Satan, get behind me. See, when he was in the peak of glory, the next moment Satan came and influenced him. And there was a, another fall. The same tongue which praised him and the same tongue called him, Satan, get behind me. My dear brothers and sisters, when you are in the peak of glories, Suppose you got a very good house, very good job, very good, uh, uh, maybe uh, you got a high promotion or salary or maybe something or marriage has taken place and you're so happy about your uh, wife and husband, you're so happy and then next moment there is an attack waiting for you. Be very careful. Praise the Lord. That means you are so exalted, the next moment you will be uh, humbled. If we are not careful. Next, we read Gospel Matthew chapter 4 verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And afterwards he was famished. Famished means hungry. He was hungry. And afterwards he was famished. Then the tempter came. 
now another place time the times of the devil the second time the timing of the devil is very important the timing of the devil he says the bible says jesus did 40 days of fasting at the end of the first 40 days of fasting he was famished he was hungry he is physically weak he is physically and emotionally weak and then the tempter came my dear brothers and sisters the timing of the devil is very important when you are at the peak of glory he comes when you are physically weak he comes Suppose suddenly you have a uh, sickness, you are bedridden, all uncertainties, anxieties. The next moment, doubts will come in your mind. Where is God? I did work for God for all these years. How come I am suffering from this sickness? The doubting spirit will start tempting you to fall into sin of denying God. Have you seen sometimes in some families when tragedies happens unexpected deaths and accidents takes place the next moment somebody or the other will come and question their faith and say where is your God you go to church every day and how come this happened to you the devil is there in these please not these timings when you are physically and emotionally weak he comes when you are in the peak of glories, he comes. Praise the Lord. But these things have to take place, my dear brothers and sisters. I used to think why God permits these temptations. And then that is when this word of God touched me. We read like this. Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 onwards. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil now listen very carefully who which spirit led Jesus to be tempted by the devil holy spirit or evil spirit which spirit led Jesus to be tempted by the devil how many of you say Holy Spirit? Lift up your hands. Some of you. How many of you say it is evil spirit? Lift up your hands. Some people lift the hands only this much. If you lift up your hands, lift up your hands straight. Okay. Very good. Praise the Lord. My dear brothers and sisters, do you think Jesus will be controlled and led by your evil spirit? Will Jesus ever permit any evil spirit to control him? Even if evil spirit lead him, will Jesus follow him? Therefore, it is not evil spirit who led Jesus to the temptation or the, to be tempted by the devil, but it is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit led Jesus to, to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, another thing. Will Holy Spirit lead you to something evil or bad? No. Holy Spirit will never lead you something lead you to something bad. Holy Spirit will always lead you to something very good, beneficial, useful. That means Facing temptations are beneficial and useful. Facing the temptations and overcoming the temptations are very useful and beneficial. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit will never lead Jesus to be tempted by the devil. Is that clear? 1 Corinthians 10.13 1 Corinthians 10.13 No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. Praise the Lord. 
and the word of god says god is faithful and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength but with the testing he will also provide you the way out with the testing he will give you the way out it's not before the testing or it's not after the testing but it is with the testing you will get the grace to overcome the temptations each time when you face the temptations you get the gift a special grace to overcome and defeat the temptation and after facing the temptation you will have upper hand on this temptation you will have control on this temptation for example jesus was tempted by the devil three times in the wilderness three means a perfection perfect times means he was tempted lots of times three means is not just three times is a continuous time there is 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 called a perfect time perfect times it need not be just three times many times but jesus overcame even he dared to tempt jesus then he will never leave you he will never spare you even jesus was not spared then how can you how can you be spared praise the lord and remember this temptation the devil who came to tempt him tempted him but jesus did not fall into temptation he defeated him defeated whom devil and after that jesus started the public ministry and then if you closely watch the public ministry which jesus did you can see one thing wherever jesus went the devil got out of the people immediately just one word enough get out gets out he never shouted back he never fight with jesus because he is also already a loser a loser will never stand against the victorious man if you are already a victorious man or woman came out of the temptation that temptation can never stand against you anymore you will have upper hand on him wherever you go you will have upper hand on that kind of temptation there is no doubt about it praise the lord therefore every time when jesus faced the temptation the devil came uh, or a possessed man came within one word jesus could cast out the devil and the devil used to obey him my dear brothers and sisters do you want this kind of power then you have to face him then you have to face him and defeat him you have the power to defeat him and now you need the desire to defeat him you need the holiness to defeat him once you defeat him then he is a loser forever why we feel we are losers but because we never defeated him you only he only defeated us every time when a temptation we fall into temptation every time there is a desire to do evil we do it evil therefore we are always a losers is that clear praise the lord sirak 3110 second part 10b i'll read who has had the power to transgress and did not transgress who had the power to do evil but did not do it his prosperity will be established forever who has had the power to transgress means the one who had the power to do evil power to commit sin but did not commit sin his prosperity will be established means his authority his blessing his spiritual power will be established forever praise the lord for example suppose you have a temptation to watch movies or mobile phone or youtube videos unnecessary and holy videos you have in your mobile phone available 24 hours any time you can watch but you decided not to watch and you never touched it you never watched it that means you defeated you have control over 
the mobile phone. I remember one mother came and told me, Father, internet is spoiling my child. Internet has spoiled my child. Then I told her, my dear sister, don't say that. It is not internet who spoiled a child. Your child spoiled the internet. Internet will never spoil anybody unless you want it. There are so many people who are using internet for something good. Always for, only for good. I have seen so many families, so many, so many youth who are benefiting through the internet, through the YouTube. They are listening to the preachings available through YouTube. Every day, morning, afternoon, evening. They don't touch anything else. They don't listen or watch any other program. Only the preachings, uh, music and devotional songs. And they, it, they are flourishing in their spiritual life. They are using good, you know, internet for good use. And I would like to say, see, internet is making them good and holy. Then how can you say internet is spoiling your child? It is your child who is spoiling internet. Praise the Lord. My dear brothers and sisters, Bible says, who has heard the power to transgress but did not transgress, and did not, the, the, who are the power to do evil, but did not do it, his prosperity will be established forever. Jesus was tempted, he defeated. After that, the devil became a loser. Pope John Paul II was going through Parkinson's sickness all throughout his life. At the end, he died of Parkinson's sickness. Now he's a saint, right? For his canonization, there were two miracles were confirmed, accepted by the Vatican. One of those miracles was a religious nun was healed of Parkinson's sickness through the intercession of Pope John Paul II. What does it mean? We all found, we all thought Parkinson's sickness has defeated John Paul II. But now we know John Paul II, Pope, has defeated the Parkinson's sickness. Now he has authority on it. Come Holy Spirit, renew the face of the earth. Come Holy Spirit, cast your fire, give us light.